Okay, first off, thanks for, thanks for the invitation to present today. I'd also like to um, thank my co-authors as well on the bottom there. I'm going to be talking about structural inheritance and the influence that it can have on different scales of rift photography. And to do that, we're going to be looking in the um, Great South Basin in New Zealand. So when we think about uh, continental rifting, we typically think of the static models, which is the Scorthorpe and Leader example, where we have faults that form perpendicular to the extension direction. And as we continue to extend, they begin to grow and interact with one another until eventually strain becomes localized onto a through going fault system. However, this is based on the assumption that we have a very homogeneous crust that allows the faults to be randomly distributed throughout and they're always perpendicular to extension. In reality, with the image that Sasha just showed, we know that that's not the case. So we have the world, everything, when we rift a piece of crust, that crust has undergone multiple cycles of uh, rifting and orogenesis, so oceanic closing and opening. And that imparts a lot of different structures into the crust. So rather than this pristine model, we might have basement fabrics in there. We may have faults and fractures from previous rift events. We also might have larger scale sort of shear zone network or fold and thrust belts. We can have deeper uh, change in lithospheric composition or thickness. We can have igneous intrusion throughout the lithosphere. And also we might even have structures within the mantle itself. So all of these, when we um, typically think of this, the present being the key to the past, what we actually think here is that understanding the past history of these rift systems is key to understanding how the rift evolved. Understanding what was there before can influence how we understand rift evolution. All these different structures that might be present throughout the lithosphere, they can have a multiple uh, scale, multiple different styles of influence from, um, we just get the mouse, from influencing rift segmentation, such as in the Takana depression here, to influencing the location of fracture zones in the, um, uh, when we go through to break up. At the basin scale, we can have shear zones that might influence the geometry orientation of faults, controlling your basin geometry. We can also, the fault outcrop scale, we can see where basement fabrics and foliation might control fault and fracture geometry as well. When we're looking at this, we want to sort of understand what are the different styles of structural inheritance that operate within rifts and what aspects of rift physiography do they influence? And this is something that we're, we're working on at the moment is do these different structures and different um, crustal properties, do they have a sort of diagnostic signature associated with this inheritance that we can see within the fault network? So to try and answer these questions, we've got to look in New Zealand. Um, so the basement geology of New Zealand is comprised of a series of different terrains, basement terrains that are created along the southern margin of Gondwana. And these terrains can come with a range of different lithologies and have different properties in them. So we have this medium batholith here, shown in red, which is a composite uh, batholith made of multiple generations of plutons, dominantly granitic. We also have this Mirihiku basin, which is actually a sedimentary basement that has then been rifted. So it used to be a four arc, uh, four arc basin. And so these are normally strong and weak terrains. And we also have um, we also have these other terrains where we have ophiolites and schists in there. So each of these terrains has different uh, lithological properties. They each have their own unique history and have different structures within them. And also the boundaries be between terrains can also form uh, prominent heterogeneity. So these can affect rift physiography across multiple different scales. So we're going to look in this area here, which is the Great South Basin, and we can see that if we extend, if we look at the sort of basement of this rift, the uh, base rift surface, we can see the rift actually formed uh, due to the breakup of Gondwana, so rifting between Zealandia and West Antarctica during the late Cretaceous, and that formed this northeast-southwest trending rift, which is actually perpendicular with the faults, being perpendicular to the north, uh, northwest-southeast terrain boundaries. So that gives us some interesting uh, relationships there. We can see already that some of these boundaries might actually have some expression within the rift. So if you just look at this section here, you can see some basins corresponding to these boundaries. So to start with, we're going to focus in on this boundary here, the southern margin of the median batholith. And we're going to take a section across here, this area here. So you can see this minor, uh, this northwest southeast trending structure along here. And if we look at the section, so the, uh, the orange arrow corresponds to the location of the terrain boundary in map view and in cross section here. And we can see that we have this, basically this big change in physiography. So a large deposit in the foot wall and a high, uh, sorry, in the hanging wall and a high in the foot wall here. 
and this is demarcated by this uh, package of reflectivity in here with these very continuous reflections. And then we also have some more prominent high amplitude reflectivity in the footwall as well, this more top horizontal, almost dolmo type structure. And if we put the interpretation on, what we interpret this as being is a shear zone that has been um, that is along the terrain boundary. So this characteristic sort of inclined reflectivity package that we see that's exploiting this terrain boundary. And in the footwall, we actually think that this shear zone has localized along a granitic intrusion that's been part of the median batholith. If we move a little bit along strike here, we see the same sort of relationship again. So you can see the orange arrow representing the, um, the, uh, the actual boundary. And if we put the interpretation on, we see the shear zone that's exploiting that boundary. And it's along, and it's localized along the margin of this granitic body in here, sort of the, with this dolmo geometry. So we actually, if we look at the, um, if we look at the well data in this area, so we've got a couple of wells in here and here, we can date this intrusion, and this has actually been what we think this relates to is a early Cretaceous intrusion, a part of this separation point batholith suite, which is consistently along the southern margin of the batholith. So, so what we think is happening in here is we have this shear zone, this relatively young um, intrusion on the southern margin of the batholith. During rifting, this has then uh, localized the shear zone and fault system across that. So this terrain boundary has been reactivated. So the strength contrast between the two terrains has been exploited by the shear zone and later faulting. And if we take this to, um, I mean, if you see this all the way along, we see the similar relationship actually if we go to the north as well in the Taranaki Basin and further along strike in the South Island here. So we can see the separation point baffle suite, which is shown by these uh, horizontal lines, extends up and around to the Alpine Fault along the southern margin of the baffle and when we take that to the North Island, we can see that this batholith is again here and is again exploited by these uh, fault systems. So we think that the strength contrast between this these two basement terrains is actually what localizes and can reactivate this terrain boundary. So moving on from this, we're going to go on from the whole from the larger rift scale here, and we're going to look a bit more in detail at what's going on at the fault level. So we're going to stay in the median batholith in this area here. But we're going to focus now on the separation, oh, I'm sorry, on the other side of the separation point batholith suites in here. So you can see the sort of uh, northern boundary of this, of this granitic body, this separation point batholith in here, with this with a lack of faulting across it. And one thing to note is that this northeast trending rift related fault, as it approaches this boundary, begins to segment into and splay into multiple different fault segments. So we can look at that, we'll just take a few sections going from, uh, going from northeast to southwest along this fault system and see what looks like and see how it changes as it approaches this granitic body to the south. Initially, uh, all the accommodation is, um, the faulting is accommodated by a single plane with potentially some early activity. If we move further to the southwest, we start to see that the footwall begins to be dissected into these numerous splays with a series of antithetic structures also forming. Moving southwest still, we see that we no longer have a um, dominant hanging wall or foot wall here. Instead, we have this larger uh, graben of deformation. So deformation is accommodated by this wider zone. As we get, as we approach this boundary, we actually see that the polarity switches so off the east dipping structure in the north to a northwest dipping structure further south. So we think this is actually due to this these faults here are actually rooting along the granitic body in this area here. But one thing we also see is that the, as they're approaching these faults, the individual segments begin to rotate and align themselves with this northwest southeast trending boundary. So what we did was we basically took this fault system, this playing fault system, we calculated throw length plots for each of the individual fault segments, and we tried to look at how throw was um, accommodated along the whole of the fault system. So, about, so we measured for length plots for all of these and then projected them onto a single plane following this black line here. So as we do that, we can see that you'd expect in the northeast, we have throw accommodated by a single structure here. And then as this fault stops and, we, and uh, begins to splay, this fault dies. But we can see that throw is still accommodated along, we have relatively low throw faults, but we have a lot more of them in this area here, which are all these individual fault splays. 
So what we noted, however, is that if we look at the cumulative fault throw across this whole system, that remains relatively constant right up until we get to this boundary with the foot with the um, with the granitic body here, this stronger material. So what we think is happening in here is that as the fault is um, approaching this stronger material, the fault it's more this material is more resistant to faulting, and the fault tries to terminate. And to do that, rather than have this high displacement gradient, this high throw gradient at the boundary, it begins to segment. So each of these individual fault segments has a much lower throw gradient than the overall system. And that allows them to then, sorry? 10 minutes. Okay. That allows them to then rotate and align with that boundary. So one issue we had with this was that, um, why did the fault start to segment here, outboard of the boundary, rather than very close where we see low stress perturbations on these boundaries. So we see these faults begin to change orientation and we see local stress perturbations associated with this strong granitic body. But we see the faults starting to uh, segment very much outboard, 10 to 20 kilometers away from there. And what we think was happening is that if we have the dipping boundary of this path lift, which we saw in the seismic section, sort of dipping towards the north, the actual vertical, the height of the faults is initially inhibited, because you can see in here, and that causes, uh, so that, and then that causes the faults to begin to splay and segment as they approach. And then the, um, we basically get these, the lateral propagation of the fault being inhibited closer to the boundary. So now moving on from this, so we've looked at the terrain boundaries, we've looked at the stronger material. Now we're going to basically zoom back out again and look at the influence of this overall crustal strength and physiography. So if you look at the different terrains, so we've got this strong material here, relatively weaker here, we can see a few expressions of this in the rift already. So we can see these embayments in the rift margin in this location and here and here. We can see that this medium batholith, the stronger one, is actually relatively shallow compared to the other areas. And we can also see areas of fault termination, uh, changes in fault polarity. And what this actually, and if we basically try and mark these areas out in the rift, we can continue these um, basically these terrain boundaries in the offshore domain. And we, can, we also note that these are, um, these terrain boundaries may actually represent sites of magnetism and focused magnetism over long periods. So one of the key things that we looked at in here is that we can see a relatively marked changes in the rift structural style over very short distances. This is in the Mirihiku terrain, which is this characteristic sedimentary basement. So we can really confidently extend this offshore. And we can see it's uh, northwest dipping faults relatively closely spaced together. However, if you move around 10 kilometers to the north, 10, 20 kilometers north, we see a completely different structural style in the Don Mountain Mai Tai terrain here, with relatively wide, wider spaced faults, more uniform sort of southeast dipping structures. And this led us to thinking about how these different strengths of these different basement terrains would affect the rift physiography. What characteristic effects might you have for a weak versus a strong basement terrain? So to do that, we, took a, uh, we did some numerical modeling using Aspect. And we uh, rift extended a 500 by 500 kilometer squared area. And we ascribed some different terrains with nominal weak, strong, and normal strengths within them. And these strengths were just um, represented by varying the amounts of initial plastic strain in there. So the weak areas have more initial plastic strain representing greater uh, amounts of heterogeneities upon which strain can localize, whereas the strong material had uh, much less heterogeneities where strain can localize within them. So when we do that, this is what we come up with. So we rifted for 10 million years, and we can already see a marked difference in the structural style between the weak terrain here, where strain rapidly localizes along these, um, along these faults with some pronounced strain shadows, compared to the more diffuse strain with relatively little faulting or lots of low displacement faulting in the strong domain. This is a few snapshots of this. We can see that we have that rapid localization, widely spaced faults in the weak domain, whereas we have um, diffuse faulting in the strong domain with lots of potentially relatively closely spaced low displacement structures where strain isn't really able to localize. And an interesting point to note is that the normal domain, which is adjacent to the weak, actually localizes strain earlier and, uh, than the one that is adjacent to the strong domain. So what we think is happening is that the strain is localizing these weaker areas and then sort of propagating outwards into the adjacent stronger domains. So this is something that's ongoing and we're still working on this and trying different scenarios of what to investigate. So just to conclude, uh, we've shown that we can have structural inheritance 
operating across multiple scales and influencing different uh, aspects of rift physiography. We've got the Great South Basin developing across this lithologically heterogeneous basement. On the terrain boundaries at the largest scale, these can form pronounced strength contrasts that might be reactivated during rifting, and that can give a first order segmentation to your rift systems. We can see that even at the, within these areas, st uh, stronger areas of crustal material, so these, in this case, the granitic bodies, they may be more resistant to faulting, and they can actually represent barriers to both vertical and lateral fault propagation within the rift. When these settings of faults may splay as they approach, uh, altering the rift structural style of your faulting in there, but these systems do maintain kinematic coherence across the fault system there. And finally, we looked at the crustal strength, so the actual properties of your basement terrain have a profound influence on rift physiography generally. So we find that stronger areas tend to be characterized by more numerous, relatively low strain structures, sort of distributed across a wide area, whereas within the weaker areas, we get rapid strain localization onto a few high strain structures in there. And these are the references here, but I'll just leave it on this one. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Tom. Do we have, uh, we have time for one question? Do we have a question? No need to put them in the chat because if we have one question, only the one who starts talking first is the one who asked the question. I have a question if no one else does. I don't want to jump in though. No, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Tom. No, it was really nice to see your modeling results. Hmm. Do you have any idea kind of how much stronger the strong terrain is from the weak terrains? Do you have any controls over that? Is there any, you know, do these terrains outcrop? Can you take samples and measure it? Or is it just a bit of a guess in the modeling? One's a bit weaker than the other. So we're trying to, at the moment, we're trying to keep it quite general. So we're doing different strength contrast between, uh, so we're trying basically relatively strong, we're trying all the different areas of the parameters that we can do. So relatively strong, strong and weak, strong, if okay. that makes sense. But I think the, the key issue is we know, we think that the granites are relatively stronger, but we don't know how, I guess with it being a composite pluton, in the strong domain, so there's lots of different pollutants in there. There will be strength contrast between in the actual, in the sort of real world examples. So I think this is more of a first order control on yeah. what happens if you have no heterogeneities to lots of them. Yeah. Okay. Kind of exploring parameter space on the strength. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.